This video is sponsored by Raycon. Ruth turned away, still crying. She had conceived a secret hatred for the corn, and sometimes dreamed of walking into it with a torch in each hand when dry September came, and the stalks were dead and explosively combustible. But she also feared it. Out there, in the night, something walked, and it saw everything, even the secrets kept in human hearts. Dusk deepened into night. Around Gatlin, the corn rustled and whispered secretly. It was well pleased. These brooding final words in Stephen King's 1977 short story, Children of the Corn, make for one of the most bone-chilling descriptions I've ever read in horror fiction, especially when taking into account the brutal ordeal that comes before it. For a writer infamous for typically botching his conclusions, Children of the Corn's ending pulverizes you into utter sadness. It solidifies the frail yet deeply unsettling calmness conveyed throughout the story. However, what hurts the most is that the 1984 film adaptation fails to deliver that same raw, haunting emotion. I'm not going to say it's the worst adaptation, at least not when it comes to Stephen King's work, however, it pains me to think that there are many people out there whose only true experience of Children of the Corn is a dull, campy slasher flick that severely dilutes the eerie bleakness of the short story. Despite having a bit of a cult following when it comes to stories about evil bastard children, see my video on The Omen for reference, Children of the Corn is effectively King's own version of the Wicker Man meets Village of the Damned. It tells the story of a rural Nebraskan town called Gatlin, where years prior, the local children barbarically massacred every adult in town. Through a combination of shootings, stabbings, hangings, poison, and even disembowelment, and formed their own isolated hostile sect, who worship a demonic deity known as He Who Walks Behind the Rose, which supposedly lives deep within the cornfield. Here's the thing, on the surface, it's easy to dismiss the premise as a little silly, but trust me, no matter how bonkers any of King's stories get, he always finds a way to craft something grimly compelling out of it. So I do implore you before we get into the finer details of the story to read the short story for yourself to understand why I find the film so frustrating. Without giving too much away on the outset, Children of the Corn falls into what I like to call the Stephen King Nihilism Collection, a morbid cheese platter that pairs nicely with a fine Cujo, Pet Cemetery, or Long Walk Merlot. It's clear as day from the initial premise that the focus is exploring religious fanaticism and the poisoning of young minds to the most literal degree, seeing as the sect, or cult if you prefer, is led by charismatic children who indoctrinate almost every child in town into their terrifying beliefs. In a rather backwards adaptation choice, you'll be surprised to know that the film actually tones down the mysterious delivery in favour of a flat, sanitised, by the numbers retelling of the events, with the ambiguity surrounding what our two adult protagonists, Bert and Vicky, discover being almost entirely gone. It's odd to me that the issue isn't the film stretching thin a short story to theatrical runtime, it's that it chooses to be very blunt about things, and lacks any creative drive to build up the terror or suspense that King masterfully crafts. Sure, it does at least follow the events directly from King's story, but it severely lacks in nuance, and with the addition of a few contrived changes, the film gives away too much too early, thus killing any real sense of mystery. For one, in King's version, the children do not appear until over the halfway point when Bert begins to piece together a theory as to what the hell is going on. With the exception of the eventual reveal of the children, Bert and Vicky are the only characters in the story, with the empty town and dead silence making the whole situation feel like a post-apocalyptic nightmare. The short story is built on Bert's sensation that he and Vicky are always being watched, not so much by the children they've yet to encounter, but by the seemingly malevolent presence that lurks within the cornfields, which they've uh, also yet to encounter. This is exactly why I compare it to the atmosphere of the Wicker Man. There is a deeply 
unpleasant feeling that something bad is coming, but you don't exactly know what it is. You are genuinely made to feel like an outsider or outlander in the case of the film who simply doesn't belong. The main problem I have with the film's depiction of the events is that the kids appear right from the opening, and because we see so much from their perspective, they don't have the same relentless bloodthirsty quality they exhibit upon their sudden arrival in the short story, which feels more akin to the arrival of the ghouls in Night of the Living Dead. The film humanizes them too much by inviting us openly into their world, thus contradicting the entire point of them being a closed off hostile cult that can't be reasoned with. In short, the less you see or learn about them, the harder it becomes to rationalise what exactly is going on. In the short story, it isn't until the very end that we get a brief insight into their personalities, which then is just enough to cast a tragic shadow over their circumstances, but I'll come back to that in the ending spoilers. As we go along, please leave your thoughts in the comments below, including a cheeky wee like and subscribe to help feed the algorithm gods, and before we go any further, here are a few words from this video sponsor, Raycon. Black Friday is now upon us, and if you're like me, gift shopping is typically a badly timed last minute panic. However, thankfully Raycon are here with the perfect solution long before the madness truly settles in. Raycon's selection of wireless earbuds, headphones and speakers make for an easy holiday gift for everyone in your life, including yourself. Whether it be your parents, friends or lovers, Raycons are right for every scenario, from peaceful leisure listening to blasting through fitness goals to trying your best to last longer than 10 seconds while playing Call of Duty. Gamers, fitness fanatics and normal folk can rejoice in Raycon's premium sound quality, almost custom comfortable fit, seamless functionality and battery life lasting up to 54 hours. And all of this starts at half the price of other premium audio brands on the market. And if that's not enough, if you click the link in the description box below or go to buyraycon.com slash Ryan and use the code EARLYBF, you can get 20% off site wide or even save bigger with 30% off Raycon's exclusive holiday bundles such as gaming earbuds for mobile and switch and headphones for PC and console and the Stay Fit bundle which includes earbuds for yourself and speakers for everyone else. There will also be different deals coming throughout the season and I'll try to keep the description box updated with the latest offers. But just so you know, you can always go to buyraycon.com slash Ryan to get the best deals available on Raycon and to support my channel. So, going into Bert and Vicky's story, like with most horror protagonists, they're simply in the very wrong place at the very wrong time. In the film, they're a loving couple travelling to the west coast so Bert can interview for a medical internship, which is a far cry from the short story's cynical version of a couple trying to save their shattered marriage with an ill-conceived vacation. It's along this empty road where Bert accidentally batters a fleeing child with his car and quickly shifts blame onto the kid's apparent sliced neck, leading to one of the older children, Malachi, getting salty that he only got an assist as Bert stole his kill. It's this scene that really sets the tone for what follows, and it perfectly demonstrates what I mean by the film's severe lack of nuance. In the film, we know that the cult's lieutenant Malachi kills the kid because we follow the setup from their perspective, and while violent, yes, having the setup pre-established kills both the surprise and mystery in the short story story's delivery. In King's version, there's no pre-warning. The kid just comes out of nowhere with the attention to detail being placed on Bert's perspective, which describes the throat slash as ragged and inefficient, thus seemingly unorthodox, with Bert coming to the vague suspicion that a shadow in the cornfield is watching them. That last bit is open to interpretation at first, but at the very end, casual dialogue does confirm it was Malachi, who along with the other kids, don't actually have any any characterization in King's story to maintain the deliberate ambiguity. Regardless, we know the murder kids are eventually going to appear, but until then, it's that unseen sense of feral evil that slowly seeps into your conscience. We have no idea what structure, order or reason these children have. Until Bert investigates the local church and puts together his theory, these kids could be literal fucking monsters for all we know. 
It's after the dust has settled in the end and they begin to speak calmly does it hit you with the realization that they're completely conscious and desensitized to their actions as it's become normalized. Furthermore, in the film, this scene pretty much concedes any real attempt at emotional intelligence, because Bert and Vicky's reaction to having just manslaughtered a kid is much number than it ought to be. It's not because they're in shock, although that would make sense, it's just that the film doesn't exactly know what it wants to do with these characters. Technically, you could argue they're a bit more fleshed out in the film because of the emphasis placed on their young, carefree spirited love for each other, and the slight tension in Bert emotional distance as he stresses over his career prospects. We do somewhat slowly see Bert develop into a character who wants to commit more to his relationship, which is first called attention to when listening to a melodramatic evangelist preacher on the radio, declaring it a sin to engage romantically outside of wedlock and this antiquated patriarchal belief in the nuclear family. I was going to say the whole idea of Bert and Vicky going through this whole violent ordeal to then suddenly want to start a family sounds ridiculous ridiculous, but then I realized South Park beat me to it when they did an episode parroting Children of the Corn. Anyway, I'm starting to get caught up on pedantics again. I think choosing to make Bert and Vicky sympathetic in the film is a fair change given the tone it sets for the rest of the story, so let's get into the town of Gatlin and the horrors that transpire. The actual evangelical fanaticism does come off as rather comical in the film when compared to the eerie subtlety of King's story, but I'm not the first person to sing the praises of the genuinely devoted performances of Malachi and the cult's leader Isaac. I am the word and the giver of his laws. Disobedience to me is disobedience to him. They're at least fun to watch, making up for the drab and dreary everything else, but there is a realism within King's presentation of the cult that makes for a pretty powerful revelation. In King's version, Vicky makes a point that the preaching on the radio, a child by the way, is pure drivel. All the biblical jargon seen by both characters feels exactly this way, especially when driving through the back road known as the Bible Belt. It's designed to sound judgmental and brash, which in the mind of undereducated children susceptible to such material, hammers in the point about driving their cult through fear rather than through meaning. The whole town's superstitious conceit is that they need to produce a bountiful harvest that can only happen if some asshole wrathful god is happy. The thing is, while the motive has an endgame in The Wicker Man, Children of the Corn doesn't really rationalise why they're obsessed with the corn itself. It's merely a signifier of their god's happiness. In fact, in the short story, Bert compares the corn to the bread and wine at communion, which represents the body and blood of Christ, with the descriptions of the all too perfect corn symbolising the end of Gatlin's sinful nature. The children never seem to truly understand why they're devoting their lives to a god that doesn't respect them in return. The entire community is driven by a hive mind bred into blind obedience or face death. There is no alternative where they themselves prosper. Put it this way, if you defy the teachings, you're exiled and executed as the roadkill implies, but once you're off the rightful age of 19, you're sacrificed to the demon god anyway, so it's a pretty shit deal if you don't mind me saying. However, that's just the terrifying reality behind these sorts of real-world cults. If you don't abide by what the leaders and community say, you face their wrath, but if you do, the result is… A healthy kind of wrath? It's implied even more so in the short story that the cult has existed for over 10 years, so it even has members raised from birth into biblical scriptures that are distorted and modified to fit this cult's way of thinking. Hell, in the short, their leader Isaac is only 9 years old, with their previous leaders having been sacrificed after coming of age. This is confirmed by Burt upon investigating the local church, where he discovers strange drawings that allude to something living in the cornfield field, as well as elements of ritual sacrifice. The major plot revelation is when he opens the Bible to discover that only the Old Testament remains intact, thus the cult follow what we could call the uh, negative and antiquated part of the Bible, where God's wrath is most apparent. You rewriting the whole thing or just the parts that suit your needs? 
Now, there is one little detail in King's story that does conflict with the strong religious context of these selectively superstitious close-knit communities, and that's describing their fashion as Quakers inspired, which I get what he's going for with this sort of strong-headed disciplined Puritan vibe, but to my understanding, Quakers communities are actually pretty loving and inclusive, so it goes against the whole message here. Well, that's unless the idea was to further King's commentary on religious leaders skewing and manipulating the fundamentals to fit their fire and brimstone narrative, but I'm getting annoyingly pedantic again. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ryan, is the whole demon angle ambiguous? Is it going to be one of those crazy religious conspiracies like Red State or Wicker Man where something supernatural doesn't technically happen? Well, it is a Stephen King story, so... Brace yourself for spoilers, I guess. Yeah, it's not really a surprise to say there is something actually living in the cornfield, but its true origins are never confirmed, nor do we get a full idea as to what it actually looks like. In the short, we get a glimpse of the physical monstrosity, whereas the film goes for something out of the Black Cauldron. I, 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 I'm, I'm genuinely speechless as to what the fuck they were actually thinking here. It honestly would have been better if they had just not shown anything at all. At this point, both versions via in completely different directions, with the film introducing a mutiny perpetuated by Malachi after he conflicts with Isaac over the ritual process. The film's added focus on this sort of Lord of the Flies, inner politics tribalism of the cult did nothing for me, and the outcome sees Bert manage to break the kids out of their delusion after the leaders are executed by the demon. Bert then proceeds to destroy the quorum by following the methods of a previous exorcism attempted by the now deceased local sheriff in creating a lake of fire, or in other words, he decides to scorch earth that motherfucker, bringing this whole madness to an end. However, in King's version, Bert and Vicky don't really make it that far. After the couple are first attacked, Vicky is abducted while Bert instinctively kills a kid after being stabbed, and legs it into a suspicious opening in the cornfield, suffering from exhaustion, delirium, and blood loss. It's described as a bad dream, which I feel the film actually gets right with the post-apocalyptic look of the town and the eerie stillness of everything around the couple, like they're trapped in some bubble disconnected from reality. But where the story gets grim is when the cornfield starts to close in around Bert as if he just entered the belly of the beast, and soon reconvenes with Vicky, who is now crucified dead with her eyes ripped out and her body stuffed with corn. Yeah, fucking far cry from where the movie goes, I'll tell you that. Bert is then quickly consumed by the beast, and the third person perspective of the story shifts to the cult, who watch the corpses coldly and unsatisfyingly. What makes this perspective shift so effective is how it now suddenly humanizes these feral children into a group seemingly fearful of what comes next. In the movie, we understand it's a cult controlled by fear, but the subtle distinction in the short is the reaction of the children for feeling to sacrifice the adults themselves. Isaac appears before the children to tell them that the demon sent him a vision of displeasure, that it had to finish the job for them because it was committing blasphemy, and as punishment for their failure, it lowers the age of favour from 19 to 18. Thus, its older members, including Malachi, are now ripe for sacrifice and willingly enter the corn to fulfil their duty. The ending is very organically delivered, and allows you to piece together your own understanding of what was going on, but it's the final emotional response by Malachi's pregnant partner Beth that seals the tragedy within the cult. Despite being deeply embedded in the cult, Beth resents her situation. She's left broken by her love sacrificing himself to a cause that makes no real sense. The last lines are her desperate wishes to destroy the corn like Bert does so in the film. Yet the mere thought can be read by the creature. Thus, she can't think for herself without fear of retribution. It makes it clear that this wasn't just a bad dream for Bert and Vicky but also a real, unending nightmare for the children of the corn.
And there we have it. I hope I've gone some way into giving justice to King's short story and how the film feel to really capture the essence of it. I am aware there are like a dozen sequels, I haven't seen a single one of them, so if you have, please tell me about them in the comments below. Maybe they're good? I don't really know. And until next time, stay safe, stay away from cornfields, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye!